have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans, Romans chapter 15, as you can tell, we're setting aside our study in Philippians, you may have been able to gather by the fact that I had to turn to Romans. Uh, today I want to start a short series uh, on missions, we're deciding missions, with our missions conference coming up uh, in a few weeks, I want to set our hearts and our minds um, on missions, and get them in the right place as we prepare for the conference. So while you're turning there, uh, talk, a minute, talk a minute about what missions is. Basically, it's the carrying out of God's mission in the world. It's a simple definition for you. Uh, it's, uh, it's carrying out His purposes. What is His purpose? What is His mission? Uh, throughout history and, and now, it will ultimately, it's His war. God wants to make His awesome greatness and His amazing grace known to all of the world. Uh, and it's that awesome greatness and that amazing grace that really has a profound impact on humanity. And so missionary work is ultimately all about making that glory known to the world. It's, it's pointing people to God uh, so that they will ultimately worship Him. Uh, it's, it's bringing people to Jesus Christ, sharing Christ with the world so that they might uh, believe in Him, know Him, and ultimately worship Him. And so missions is necessary uh, in our world because the world, by and large, they're not worshiping God. They're not honoring God. They're not submitting to him, right? So because of that, every believer, every one of us, is to be involved in God's mission. And so the next few weeks, we're going to look at how we can be involved in mission, how we can be involved in God's mission for the world. And so one of the ways that we can be involved that we're going to look at today is we can pray. And that's what our focus is uh, in this text in Romans 15, verses 30. Through 33. Uh, missionary Paul here uh, is writing to the church. He's informing uh, the Roman church of his future plans, his, his goals, his desires, uh, the things that God is leading him to do for the cause of Christ, for the, for the sake of the mission. And so in order to accomplish those purposes, he is seeking prayer from the church. And so Romans 15, verses 30 through 33, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. And the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the time that we can spend together, for the time that we can look into your word this morning, we ask that as we do that, uh, that you would motivate us to pray for our missionaries, that your spirit would uh, move us uh, to, uh, to love uh, you, love your mission for the world, and love those who are proclaiming the gospel to fulfill that mission, so that we might be compelled uh, to pray for those servants who are on the front lines of the gospel ministry. We pray that as we look into this text and see uh, what you have for us here and you be magnified and glorified through all of it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I said, God's purpose for the world is making his uh, glory known. And he does it primarily through the preaching of the word. But God has sovereignly tied the success of that preaching on prayer. Uh, of course, the gospel must be proclaimed because it is the power of God that leads salvation. Uh, but God has chosen to unleash that power through the faithful, fervent prayers of the church. God continually calls the church to agonize, to work together in prayer uh, throughout the scriptures, uh, which is often a difficult task for us to do. They call us to a physical activity, uh, and we're ready to go. Uh, I'll sign up, uh, but call us to pray, and it's easy to find other things to do. It's easy, it's easy to find excuses not to pray, but we must pray, and we must pray for our missionaries. One writer said, prayer is the mighty engine that moves the missionary work. Uh, Hudson Taylor said, when I get to China, I will have no claim on anyone for anything. My claim will be alone in God, and I must learn before I leave England to move men through God by prayer alone. So prayer is at the heart of missionary work. Uh, and prayer must be on our hearts to pray for our missionaries. Most of you have probably heard of, of William Carey. Well, he had a friend named Andrew Fuller, and he told his friend before he, before he went to India, he said, I'm going to go into the pit, 
but I need you to hold the ropes. I need you to support me on the other end. And Fuller did that. And one of the ways that we can hold the ropes for our missionaries is by getting on our knees and praying for them. And so that's what Paul seeks here from the church in Rome. He says, I need your prayer. And so before we look at uh, really why we should be praying, or actually that's what we're going to look at first, is why we should be praying, but then we'll look at how we should pray. And so Paul gives us pretty good motivation here in verse 30. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So one of the reasons we don't pray is that we don't have the right motivation. Sometimes it's, it's hard uh, to be motivated to pray because maybe we think prayer isn't accomplishing anything, or if God is sovereign, why should we pray anyway? But as we've said in, in past messages, well, if God is not sovereign, then there's no point in praying. But because God is sovereign, and he can actually do something for, regarding our prayers, that's why we do pray. He is in control, and he's chosen, and he's designed a plan in which he will work through the prayers of his people. Sometimes sometimes it's hard to, to pray. We're not motivated because we feel like we're too busy. Uh, sometimes we just don't feel like it, and so we're not motivated. And so Paul gives us some motivation here in this, this passage uh, to pray. He's not going to browbeat us. He's not going to give guilt trips here. He says that we are to pray for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Ultimately, he says, Pray for me for the sake of Christ, for the sake of Christ's glory, for the sake of Christ's honor, for his purposes. So pray for me that his purposes will be accomplished in the world. That's why I want you to pray, because I want the glory of God to be made evident to the world. And that's really the basis for all prayer. Uh, every prayer we see, you know, if we look at uh, what we call the Lord's Prayer, or really the disciples' prayer, when Jesus taught them how to pray. Uh, he says, pray for, uh, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Pray for God's glory. In John 17, this was Christ's prayer, that he might be glorified. Every prayer should be fixated on bringing God's glory to the world. Showing the world through our actions, our attitudes, our affections, what God is like. Representing him well. That's what we want. We want the world to see how great our God is. We agree God is great. The world's not there yet. Uh, and so the goal of missions, the goal of our prayers is that they too might see how awesome our God is. And so Paul says, pray to this end. Pray for the sake of Jesus Christ. Pray for the sake of his glory. If we want God's glory to be seen in the world, we must pray. We have to pray. And so that's one motivation, quickly. Uh, not only are our prayers to be motivated by and rooted in the display of God's overwhelming greatness, his overwhelming grace, but we also are compelled by love to pray, he says. He says, for the sake of Jesus Christ, for his glory, and also for the love of the Spirit. So we pray because of love. Because the Spirit is working in us, and we're believers, and he's producing love in our lives. And so that love should cause us to pray for our missionaries, specifically here. Now, the idea is that we pray for those who we love. I think that probably goes without saying, right? I'm sure if I asked you this morning, how many of you pray for your loved ones, every hand would go up. Um, or you wouldn't be afraid to admit it if you didn't, right? Because some of your loved ones are sitting here, so I don't want them to know. But, but we pray for our loved ones, those that we love. And, and as we're compelled, as we're moved by the Spirit working in our lives, love should produce prayer in our lives. We pray for our kids because we love them. We pray for our spouse because we love them, and we want them to change so that they're more likable, right? No. Uh, but we pray for our, our family members because we love them. We pray for people that we love. We pray for those that we care about. If we care for somebody's soul, if we care for somebody's eternal destiny, we'll pray for their salvation. Uh, if we care for somebody who we know is struggling with a particular sin or a particular issue, we love them, and so we pray for them. And, and so Paul says, because you love uh, God's glory, you love me, your servant, pray for me. Strive together. Pray for me. One writer says, prayer is born of the Spirit of God within us, awakening a desire to help, a sense of love and compassion. So then we pray out of love, and we pray to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we hear of our missionaries have a meeting, we pray for them because we love them. Uh, and we desire to see God's glory uh, fulfilled through their work. And so that's why we pray. We pray because we want God to be glorified, and we pray because we love people. And we, we have a compassion. 
for our missionaries, but also for the souls that they're preaching the gospel to. And so this love should drive us to pray for our missionaries. Uh, and it should drive us to make time and set aside uh, to pray for them. So then how do we pray for them? Uh, how do we pray for them? We want to pray now. Okay, we're motivated, Paul. Uh, what do we do? Well, when that, he begins, and I want to look at this for a few minutes, I beseech you, he says. So we pray obediently. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pray obediently first. We pray faithfully uh, out of obedience to God's call to pray. Uh, often we're, we don't pray, I said, because we're tempted to see the physical things only. And so we tend to, to leave prayer to physical needs. Uh, when we see a physical need, we're, we're, we're right there to pray. But, you know, a lot of the most pressing issues that we deal with, I know you feel like it when you're struggling with a physical need, but the pressing issues are spiritual. They're below the surface. And, and there's a spiritual battle that's taking place in the world uh, in the lives of, of every human being, uh, and Ephesians 6, 12 testifies to that. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so because of the spiritual struggles that are going on uh, in the lives of the people and in the world, we must pray. And we must pray for those who are on the front lines, those who are engaged in this spiritual warfare. And we're speaking specifically to anybody who is ministering the gospel uh, faithfully. It's missionaries, pastors, parents, uh, teachers, anybody who is taking the word, ministering to people. Because it is, it is hard work. Paul says this in Colossians. He says, I, I labor in this. I toil in this, this work, this spiritual work. Because it is difficult. And so those who are who are in this ministry, missionaries, need our prayers. Because there is a battle waiting. And I think we all know it. We try to do something spiritual. We try to uh, prepare for a, a Sunday school class and, uh, or teaching ministry or anything. And distractions, uh, disillusionment, anything comes up. Sleepless nights. Uh, it always seems uh, that Saturday nights for our house are the most challenging. If the kids are going to have nightmares, uh, it's going to be Saturday night. They're going to wake us up. If I'm going to have a tough, tough time sleeping Saturday night, why is that? Why do you think that is? There's a spiritual battle going on. It's real. And so we need to be praying about those things. And, and so Paul says, you know, I beseech you, I beg you, I urge you to pray for me. Now, we're often maybe tempted to think that Paul is so gifted and so accomplished that he didn't need prayer. But why do you think we think of Paul the way we think of Paul? Because he sought prayer. And people were praying for him. That's why he was able to accomplish everything that he was able to accomplish. Because the church prayed for him. Hudson Taylor said, again, I'm using these missionary quotes because they know better than, than most of us. I've seen many men work without praying, though I've never seen any good come out of it. And Paul knew this. He knew it wasn't him that made anything happen. He knew he needed God's help, and so that's why he urges the, the Roman church here to pray for him. And besiege is a, is a strong word of exhortation and urging. He's not mildly suggesting that the church, uh, if they get around to it, uh, could you say a little prayer for me if, if you're not too busy, if it doesn't trouble you? Uh, no, that's not what he's saying. If you can fit it in your busy schedule, maybe you know once in a while, could you pray for me? No, he says, I urge you, I beg you. He's pleading with them because he knows he needs it. He needs this. I implore you, strive together with me in prayer. God, through his work, commands the church to pray we must, especially for our missionaries, for those serving in the gospel ministry and Paul and his church. He could do this. He continually asks the church to pray. We'll look at some of those requests in a few moments because he understood that, that he needed God in order to accomplish anything of spiritual significance. God has created us with the ability to do a lot of things, but we can't do anything of spiritual value without His Word, without His Spirit, and without His working through prayer. We can be smart, we can be charming, we can be funny, we can be entertaining, we can seemingly have it all together. We can have the most state-of-the-art uh, equipment, greatest programs, best uh, website, music, sermons, all of it. But if God is not there working, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And so prayer is necessary. One writer says prayer is often the most, the, often the missing ingredient in the lives of most believers and churches. Do we think for a moment that we could be involved in supernatural ministry without supernatural involvement? Now we probably don't actively think that, but our lives often communicate that. We must pray for our missionaries. We have to. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a study that was done by an agricultural school in Iowa, not about prayer, but the study showed that the production of 100 bushels of corn from one acre of land required 4 million pounds of water, 6,800 pounds of oxygen, you're like, why am I trying to know this, 5,200 pounds of carbon, 160 pounds of nitrogen, 125 pounds of potassium, 75 pounds of yellow sulfur, in case you wanted to do this, I just thought I'd inform you, as well as other elements that we don't have, we don't have time for. Uh, but in addition to these ingredients, of course, you need rain and sunshine at the right time. And so there's <clears throat> all of this stuff. And, and, and although the farmer is involved, many hours of labor, it was estimated that only 5% of the produce of a farm can be attributed to the efforts of man. 5% not discouraging farming, but 5%. But the same thing is true in ministry. And it is God who gives the increase. It is God that must do the work. He must do the growing. He uh, must do his thing. We, yes, we're faithful to do our part. But often in ministries, the missing element is God. And it's his, and he works through prayer. And Paul understood this. And so he knew he wasn't going anywhere without the faithful prayers of the church. And so we must pray for our missionaries. Uh, one writer says, without prayer, missions is personnel, equipment, finances, methods, and administration. All of them utterly sterile. The fulfillment of Christ's great commission becomes possible only by the power of God released through prayer. And then I would also add, as the word of God is accurately and faithfully proclaimed. And so Paul understood this. Paul wants prayer. We can't afford to be lazy when it comes to prayer for our missionaries. We can't afford to be lazy when it comes to prayer in general. But when, I, when we're speaking of our missionaries, we can't be lazy. We must pray for them. And again, the word for beseech here uh, was an exhortation. It was called to exhort soldiers to go into battle. And so it's a call to service. And so Paul is saying, I'm calling the church into service with me to pray with me as I go to the mission field. How can you and I serve on the mission field? How can we serve the missionaries that we partner with? We can pray for them. And that's what Paul wants here. And he says, stand with me in the battle for souls and pray for me. And so we can all be involved in that work of missions by praying for our missionaries. And Paul says to the Colossians, continue in prayer, praying also for us. Be diligent, consistent, and faithful in our prayers. Um, one writer says, it is in the closet of prayer that power descends upon the preacher. It is the prayer of a mother that protects the son in the war thousands of miles away. It's the prayer of the church that meets the need of the missionary in the foreign land. May we never neglect or down by the enormous potential of prayer. So how can you get involved in the missions right now? Today, you can by praying, and you should by praying for our missionaries as they serve in the gospel ministry. So we pray obediently, and secondly, we pray, uh, we pray fervently. He says, uh, I beseech you, in verse 30, brethren, for this Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayer. You strive. I urge you because I urge you to, because of the glory of Christ, the love produced by the Spirit, that you would strive together. That you would pray fervently with me in prayer, for me in prayer. It's a battle. And he says, join with me. Don't, don't sit on the side. Just because you're not uh, physically here with me, but I beg you, get involved by praying. The word strive means to struggle. It means to agonize. It means to fight or wrestle. It was used to describe the energy and effort needed to, to compete in sports and, and to win in sports. It's also used uh, the concentration, discipline, dedication, and conviction needed to win in the battle as well. And, and so Paul uh, expects the church to pray in this way, with diligent, strenuous effort, fervent. Uh, that's a struggle, he says. Struggle with me in prayer. And so it's prayer that, that requires that type of effort and dedication. And praying for our missionaries requires that. It requires entering into the battle with them. 
on behalf of them. I know a lot of most of us probably say, well, I, I struggle in prayer. I struggle to pray, right? Uh, we look at some of those. We fight distraction. We fight uh, temptation to think our prayers are uh, of no use. But prayer is a fight of all God. And we know that the disciples, uh, when Jesus was agonizing in prayer uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, what did they do? They, they fell asleep. Uh, how many of you fall asleep when you're supposed to be praying? It only happened to all of us. Uh, but Paul says we're to struggle in prayer, not struggle to pray. We're to struggle in prayer. We're to fight in prayer. We're to join in the spiritual battle with those in the gospel ministry. Like, like Jacob wrestled with God. We're to wrestle in prayer. In Colossians, uh, we see Epaphras, who was probably the one who brought the gospel uh, to the church at Colossae. Uh, and, and Paul says at the end of that book, Epaphras, who was one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. And that's an example of a man who was putting everything he had into the work of prayer. And we don't always think of prayer as a work. It's an important and vital part to the success of the ministry of gospel. It's the success of our mission as we must pray. And it's an unwavering commitment that requires everything that we have because we know prayer is not easy. Because it doesn't look busy, right? It doesn't look like we're doing it, but we are. And we must fervently pray. I read an account of a uh, uh, pastor in Scotland who grew up in an environment uh, of abuse, drugs, uh, stealing, violence, uh, and immorality. Well, some Christians took an interest in this man, and they began to share the gospel with him. Well, he wasn't really thrilled about that, and so he reacted by smashing up their cars. That's the obvious reaction when somebody shares the gospel with you, but that's what he would do. He would spit on them and curse them out. And he didn't want them sharing Christ with them at all. But they didn't stop these believers. Uh, and so they continued to share the gospel with him. This guy ends up getting thrown in prison. Uh, and they contacted him. Uh, they wouldn't leave him alone. Uh, and, and they shared the love and showed the love of Christ to him. Well, after getting out of prison, one of the Christians then invited uh, the man to live with us. And all the while, he's keep pointing this man to Jesus Christ. Even though he continues to put up walls, he continues to resist. And eventually, eventually, after all this time, God breaks through this man's heart. Uh, and the man is saved. And then he begins to follow Christ. And he's a vibrant witness for Jesus Christ. He served as a missionary and is now a pastor. And behind all of this, behind all of these efforts, was a group of Christians who were fervently agonizing in prayer for this man and for those people who were who were sharing the love of Christ for him, knowing that it was impossible for this man to ever be saved unless the Lord worked in his life. And so they fought together in prayer until the Lord answered. And that's the type of fighting in prayer that Paul is calling the, the Roman church uh, to pray for him. That's the type of fighting in prayer that our missionaries need from you and me. That we diligently uh, dedicate ourselves to praying for them. That we approach prayer with this kind of fervency, with this kind of um, fight and dedication. That this is the kind of effort that Paul is seeking. This is the kind of effort that we need to see. One writer says, one can hardly doubt that this struggle in prayer is one of the great needs of the Christian church today. Amid all its organizing, there ought to be more agonizing. Agonizing. Are we working hard and praying for our missionaries? Are we praying fervently, fighting for them? We may never set foot on the foreign mission field, but we can enter into that field today by faithfully and fervently praying for those who are on the front lines as they represent you and me in the ministry of the world. Word. And, and, and Paul understood this, and he needed it. And, and so he says, please pray for me, because missionary work needs fervent prayer. It needs our prayers. So we must regularly strive to pray for our missionaries, to even agonize in prayer over the work that they've been called to do. So we pray obediently. We pray fervently. And number three, we are to pray specifically. And so now Paul, in verse 32, is going to give them some specific requests, some things that he's looking for. Uh, he says, so pray for me, verse 32, that I may come unto you with joy. Oh, wait, I'm just giving some prayer requests here. That's not good. Uh, verse 31, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have 
for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. So we've got three specific prayer requests. Uh, and, and so we pray specifically for our missionaries. Um, we give prayer letters. We pray specifically for them. Uh, and so Paul is speaking specifically here, and we'll look at those here. First one, he seeks prayer for safety, for protection. All right, he says, pray that I might be rescued, that I might be delivered from the unbelievers that are in Judea. Paul knew uh, he was planning on, to go, planning on going to Jerusalem. He mentions that uh, back in uh, verses uh, 25. And, and so he knows what he's walking into as he goes there. Uh, it's a dangerous situation. Uh, and so he says, please, pray that I would be protection. Pray that I'd be rescued from these people. He actually told the Ephesian elders before he was going to Jerusalem that he wasn't sure what was going to happen to him when he got there. Although he did know uh, because the Holy Spirit revealed to him that imprisonment and afflictions were waiting for him in every city of the afflictions. So he had an idea that when I go there, it's not, it's not going to be good, but I'm still dedicated to following God. Uh, and I still want your prayers uh, that I would be protected, that I would be saved. Uh, and so Paul knew that there was a danger there. But he was dedicated to the gospel. He was dedicated to the glory of God. And, and so he says, pray for me. Uh, and again, he's not, he's not praying that... Uh, he might be spared persecution or even death because we know Paul is willing to die for Jesus Christ if that's what's needed. Uh, he says and, and to the elders in, in Ephesus in Acts 20 24, I don't count my life of any value nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So he just wants to be protected so I can fulfill the ministry that God has given me. I, I'm not selfishly asking for I just want to be able to complete the task that God has given me. So pray for safety as I go to Jerusalem so that I can further the glory of God. God's given me this ministry. I want to see it through. Then, you know, I'll go give it to him. Uh, that's what we see in you know, Philippians where he says, if I, if I live, great. If I die, I'm with Christ. Uh, I gain. I, I, I'm the winner here. Uh, and so we understand that he unselfishly wants to be delivered from these, these unbelievers in Jerusalem in order to fulfill the ministry that God gave him. That's all he wants. He wants God's glory to be perfect. Whatever, however it happens, uh, I just want protection so that I may finish the work that God's given me to do. So he, for, he, he seeks, seeks prayer for protection. Now we know uh, we know how this one turned out. Paul would be rescued from three mobs, from a flogging, and an attempted assassination, but. He was beaten, he was arrested, he was tried, he was in prison. Not maybe the way we would want things to turn out, but, you know, Paul got the answer to him. They prayed. Uh, he saw prayer from the Thessalonians, too. He said, pray that we might be delivered from what you need to So we pray for protection. We pray for the protection and safety of our missionaries so that they can accomplish the work that God has given them. And we pray for their, their spiritual safety as well as their physical safety, because we know that uh, there is a battle going on for the cause of Christ. Uh, those who are ministering for the cause of Christ will face attacks, uh, spiritual attacks at the very least, but in many countries, physical attacks too. And so our missionaries need protection. They need protection from their spiritual enemy, but also in many cases a physical enemy as well. So Paul says, pray for me. Pray that, you, pray that I would be protected so that I can fulfill the work that God has called me to do. And, and so along with that, he prays for successful service. He says, uh, not only pray that I be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, but pray that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. And so he wants the service of the Lord not only to be fulfilled, but he wants it to be a success. Now, what is success in ministry? Now, many times we get the idea that success is, is bigger budgets, bigger buildings, more people, and more programs. Right? But God's definition is something far different. God's definition of success is faith, the faithful and accurate proclamation of his word. Faithfully showing his love to the world and to others. And, and so that's what Paul is ultimately seeking prayer for. Uh, he wants success, spiritual success, in the ministry. He says specifically here, specifically here that my service would be accepted of the saints in Jerusalem. Now in Romans 15, 25 and 26, we get a little bit of the idea of what he's talking about here. He says, uh, But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints 
when you're at Jerusalem. So he's headed to Jerusalem. Uh, again, dangerous territory. Right? The unbelievers don't want him there. And so now he's also a little bit nervous that the church isn't going to be too happy with him either. Uh, why is that? He's bringing an offering uh, to the church there. Again, you're thinking, bring an offering. Come on in, right? That's, that's how we think. But the idea here is that these were, these were Gentile churches that had collected these offerings. Uh, and so Paul is concerned that the Jewish believers in the Jerusalem church are going to be offended. Because remember, back in the early church, relations between Gentiles and Jews were, were, not, were not great. Uh, we're not solid, though. As, as we know, God has brought Gentile and Jews together, breaking down the dividing wall. Uh, you know, it took a little while for those tensions to die down. So Paul's a little bit nervous uh, that there might be some tension there, that the church might not receive the offer, that they would almost see it as a, a slap in the face. Uh, these Gentile believers think they're better than us, and they're they're going to give us this offering, you know that kind of that kind of thinking. And so Paul says, please pray that they would accept this gift, that they would see it for what it really is, that they would seek it, that they would receive it graciously, and they would understand that this is an act of love uh, on their part. Uh, it's not we're not saying we're better than them by by giving them money or anything like that. We're just trying to glorify God. We're trying to show His love and encourage this church. And so that's. He's seeking prayer for a successful ministry, a successful service here. And we know that when they arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received them warmly. So that prayer was answered in Acts 21, 17. Uh, and not only that, but while he was there, he, he spoke to the church uh, about what God was doing among the Gentiles. And when they heard it, they glorified God. So that's what Paul wanted. He wanted Paul to be glorified. I mean, he didn't want Paul to be glorified. He wanted God to be glorified. That's what ministry success is. God is for us. And so that's what we pray. We pray for our missionaries, that God would be glorified, that he would be magnified. Uh, and Paul seeks this type of, of prayer th throughout uh, the New Testament, you see it. He, he, he asks the, uh, the Thessalonians, in, in 2 Thessalonians 3.1, he says, Pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Right? He says, Pray that the message of the gospel would spread successfully, that it would move in people's hearts, that people would be saved, that people would uh, would receive it and honor it and, and be saved so that God would be glorified. That's what mission is about. And so we pray that the message uh, is successful, that the ministry is successful. Uh, in Colossians, he does the same thing. He says, pray that God would open up unto us a door of utterance, speak the, the mystery of Christ, uh, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Paul was in prison there, and he says, not that God would open doors for him to get out of prison, but that God would open doors to preach the gospel, that he would have opportunities to preach the gospel. So we pray that our missionaries would be able to preach the gospel, that that, that ministry would be successful. Are we praying this way for our missionaries? Are we praying that God would open doors for them to preach the gospel? Are we praying that, uh, that they would represent him well, that the word would spread successfully? That they would be successfully in the ministry that God has called them to do. That they would have boldness. Paul sought boldness from the, uh, the church at Ephesus. He says, pray for me in, in Ephesians 6, uh, 19. Uh, that, I may make, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So Paul wants boldness. Our missionaries need boldness. Paul is saying, pray for me. When, so that if I'm ever tempted to keep my mouth shut, when I need to preach the gospel, and then I won't give in to that temptation. Pray that I would have all this. And here we think, well, this is Paul. Well, if Paul needed this prayer, how much more do we need it? How much more do our missionaries need this prayer? Uh, I'm sure every one of them, like you and me, have moments and situations where they're tempted to keep quiet. We should pray that in those moments that God would give them the boldness that they need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ without compromise. So we pray for our missionaries. We pray for uh, Christian school teachers, Christian leaders, uh, pastors, parents, anyone who's involved in proclaiming the gospel. That they would have boldness, they would have opportunities, and that that message would spread successfully so that God would ultimately be glorified. Charles Spurgeon was once asked the secret of his great success, and he replied, my people pray for me. That's it. My people pray for me. We are to pray for our missionaries. 
we're going to pray for them specifically for the success of the ministry that God has called them to do. So pray when they preach. Pray when they teach. Pray when translators translate. Pray that God will touch hearts, they will open up their hearts and, and, and change their lives. Pray that the work might be successful. And finally, Paul prays not only for um, safety and spiritual success, but he also asks them to pray that he would be spiritually refreshed. He says in verse 32, so that ultimately I may come unto you with the joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. And then he says, now the God of peace be with you all. And so he desires to be spiritually refreshed by the church of Rome. After his, his specific ministry in Jerusalem is complete, he seeks to visit with the church there in order that he might be blessed by them, in order that he might be encouraged by them. Well, Paul eventually makes it to Rome by the will of God, but it was not as he Rise and chains as a Roman prisoner, we know. Uh, but it was all in God's will. And it was for the furtherance of the gospel. And Paul does go to Rome with joy, just like he wanted to. Uh, and he writes the book of Philippians uh, from a Roman prison. Uh, joyful. But he was also encouraged by some believers in Rome when he got there. In Acts 28 15, it says the brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God. And he was encouraged. And so Paul sought by God's will to make it to Rome so that he could be spiritually refreshed by this church. It may not be something that we typically think about when we're praying for our missionaries and those in any kind of ministry, but spiritual refreshment is necessary. Paul is laboring tirelessly. We've already got this idea for how often we uh, looked at uh, Paul's letters. Uh, he's laboring tirelessly. He's toiling uh, struggling for the cause of Christ, teaching and, and preaching, and so he longs to receive some spiritual refreshment of his own. Our, our missionaries labor in the gospel work, constantly preaching, teaching, ministering to others, and so they need to be ministered to as well. And so one way that we can do that, of course, is uh, encourage them and, and be hospitable to them when they come uh, to be with us. But one way we can do that right now is we can pray for them. And pray for their personal spiritual refreshment because they need it. They need others to come alongside them from time to time and feed them. They need to be encouraged by the ministry of others. So let's be diligent as we pray for their spiritual refreshment. Pray for their families that they would be encouraged. That they would be encouraged by other believers who, who are with them or who they have opportunities to to be in contact with. That, that they would be refreshed. That they'd be refreshed by their own personal time. In God's word. And so when we pray for our missionaries, we pray specifically. We pray for the, the needs mentioned in the prayer letters, but we don't stop there. Because most most missionaries have a whole lot more needs than they're ever going to share with us. That's just the reality of it. I know we want them to be as specific as possible, but there are so many things, so many battles, so many struggles that are going on that we may never hear about. But we need to pray uh, for them. Specifically, we need to pray that their ministry would be successful. We need to pray for those unspoken struggles that, that, that they deal with, uh, for their families, for the spiritual battles that they face, because we know that that is real. We know that that is always going on. Whatever shape it may take, we may never know. But we know that they need prayer in that regard. And so we must pray for our missionaries. We must be consistent, obediently praying, fervently praying, and specifically praying. Whether in sickness and in health, good times and bad times, when we feel like it, when we don't, we are to pray always. So how can we do this practically? Well, aside from having uh, a specific time of prayer for our missionaries during our personal devotions or setting aside a uh, time, I, I read of one woman who, who kept a list of missionaries beside uh, her telephone, not the cell phone probably, but that's always changing location, but uh, by her landline so that whenever she's put on hold, She'd pray for missionaries. She'd have a list of missionaries right there, so she's on hold waiting. She would just take that time to pray for some missionaries. Others have used their difficulty falling asleep uh, to pray for missionaries rather than having sheep, I guess. They would just pray for missionaries. Uh, uh, others um, would pray when working in the yard, pray while driving to work, or sitting in traffic, um, while you're washing your dishes, while you're doing the laundry. Again, these are uh, substitutes for. Uh, devoted time and prayer, but these are ways in which we can redeem the time 
and pray for our missionaries. When we have spare moments, uh, when we're not really thinking or, or doing much else, we can pray for our missionaries. Um, one book uh, that says, The end of the age of grace draws near, and the enemy of our souls is doing all he can to thwart the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And so the greatest need, he says, for missions is not money, not equipment, or new methods. The greatest need is earnest prayer. The greatest need is earnest prayer. And this is something that everyone must do. We can all help meet this need. We can all pray for our mission. Again, we may never go overseas, but we can all pray. Again, William Carey, most of us have heard of him. He's known as the father of the modern missions. He's a missionary in India. Um, but few people know that behind the scenes of his ministry, besides Andrew Fuller holding the rope, was his sister, his sister who was crippled, who faithfully, diligently fought in prayer for her brother and for the ministry that God had given him. She couldn't go, but she knew she could pray. And pray she did. And I mentioned tonight a prayer meeting we're going to emphasize uh, praying for our missionaries. So I invite you to come out with that. But God has called every one of us to pray for and to support our missionaries. The same, in the same way that he's called those missionaries to go, he's called you and me to be faithful in holding the rope, to be faithful in praying for those missionaries because God sees us as a team. Because we are a team. And so we are to pray for them, to have the boldness, the protection, the good health, the love for God, the love for others, the opportunities, the grace, the humility, the wisdom, all of those things in order to accomplish God's purpose. Those who are called to pray provide the fuel on the bonfire that is lit by those who are called to go. One writer says, and so we are called here to light the fire. Uh, it provides a fuel uh, so that that bonfire can be lit. We are to pray for our mission. We are to do it obediently, fervently, and specifically. Let's pray. Holy Father, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your desire to see souls saved. We thank you for your desire to your glory made known to the world through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you for those that have faithfully gone into the mission for you. Those who are, have gone where you call them. We are thankful for them. We're thankful for those that we have the privilege of knowing, partnering with. It really is a partnership. And Father, we must pray for them. They need you. They need uh, your help, your strength your grace, your boldness, your wisdom, your protection. And Father, you've called us to play a very important part in the work that you've called us. Father, help us to see how important the ministry of prayer is and help us to be involved. Help us to, to be willing to devote the time, to dedicate the time, to fervently and faithfully praying for those servants who are laboring in the gospel ministry. We pray that you would use those prayers. You would use those prayers to, to bring souls to yourself, 